Good afternoon. I'm Mike Farnworth, Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General. I'm speaking with you today from the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish peoples. Today I'm also joined by Katrine Conroy, Minister of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development, and her Deputy Minister, Rick Mannering. For the third time since 2017, our province, our firefighters, are up against a destructive and challenging wildfire season. The season started early with the tragedy in Lytton and the near total loss of that community. And last night, the community of Monty Lake was devastated by the White Rock Lake fire. Crews have worked tirelessly from the start and we have brought in additional support from other provinces, the Canadian military and international partners. Fire departments across BC have deployed staff and equipment to protect homes and other structures. And the RCMP, conservation officers and search and rescue crews continue to help and evacuate people as required. Our government, all of us, are thankful for the hard work and resilience of all these men and women and for the many calls of assistance that have been answered. The BC Wildfire Service continues to take on every available resource that is operationally required. Everything that can be done is being done. But while we've made tremendous progress on many fires, we continue to face real and grave danger on several fronts. Currently, the White Rock Lake Fire, west of Okanagan Lake, is the highest priority. Overnight and through this morning, the evacuation alerts and orders for this incident were greatly expanded. Thousands of people from communities such as Monte Creek, Falkland, Westwold, and the Okanagan Indian Band have been evacuated with orders covering two and a half thousand properties. And several thousand people are on evacuation alert, including communities such as Chase and parts of Kamloops. We know this is an incredibly stressful and difficult time for those who've been ordered to evacuate and for those who are preparing to evacuate. Your safety is paramount and BC Wildfire's recommendations to implement these evacuation orders and alerts are not made lightly. They reflect the tremendous growth and fire behavior seen so far on this incident, which has been beyond all our experts' projections. While it is too early and dangerous to do any assessments, witnesses are reporting there have been structure losses in some areas. With the extreme fire danger and behavior we are now facing, despite all efforts, decisions may need to be made to move crews out of harm's way. If your First Nation or local government issues an evacuation alert for your property, you need to prepare to be able to leave on a moment's notice. If an evacuation order is issued for your home, follow all instructions and leave the area immediately. Do not hesitate to get yourself and your loved ones to safety. This fire is aggressive and escape routes can and quickly be compromised or cut off completely. Now, I would like to speak directly to those who think they know more than the experts. Those who think they do not need to immediately follow the directions of their local authority. So let me be clear. Staying behind in an evacuated area not only risks your own life and the lives of your family, but it also risks the lives of the responders tasked with fighting the fire. No property is worth risking lives. Last night, firefighters with the BC Wildfire Service once again put their lives on the line to help evacuate people who chose to ignore evacuation orders. A small group of people found themselves being overrun by the rapid advance of this fire. While our crews were able to get the residents to safety, these brave firefighters very nearly paid with their lives. This experience was traumatic for all involved and should never have happened. By any measure, this is completely unacceptable. Our crews need our support. So I ask that everyone in a fire affected area take stock of what is important and what you may be putting on the line. Once an area is under evacuation order, 
you need to get out immediately. As I said, this is an extremely challenging time for our province, and we've faced no shortage of challenges in the past few years, from COVID-19 to floods to fires. I've been honoured to work with and to meet so many first responders. Just last week, I was in Kamloops with National Defence Minister Harjit Sajjan, where we thank crews for their brave efforts to battle the fires, protect communities, and assist their fellow British Columbians during this emergency. On behalf of our province, I want to express my gratitude to our firefighters what will be challenging days ahead. But we will see the other side of this fire season. We just need to work together, follow the measures that are put in place to protect us, stay safe, and to take care. I'd like now to hand things over to Minister Katrina Conroy. Uh, thank you so much, Minister Farnworth. And uh, I do want to recognize that I am speaking to you today from the Okanagan Sioux, the Asians, as well as the Sinaik Nations on whose traditional territories I'm speaking from today. And our hearts go out to the people of Monty Lake and Lytton and, and the many other places where fire is wrecking havoc or threatening communities. The destruction is devastating. The losses are heavy and you have our deepest condolences. It really is challenging, but we are up to the challenge. Everyone is working as hard as they can to deal with this year's devastating wildfire season. This is an effort involving multiple ministries at all levels of government and we're working hard to keep British Columbians safe. We know we're on the front lines of climate change history right now, facing a fire season that is one of the most challenging we've ever experienced. Our crews and partners are fighting wildfires that are aggressive and in many cases, fast moving and unpredictable. The conditions are so extreme, the landscape is so dry and the heat and drought are extremely severe. Since April 1st, there have been 1,412 wildfires in BC. There are 303 burning now, with 136 starting in last week alone. More than 583,000 5, hectares has been burned. The size of the firefighting effort is enormous. More than 3,600 wildfire personnel and more than 200 aircraft. Firefighters from fire departments across the province are also joining in to support fire crews and, and help keep communities safe. Forest industry staff and contractors are also an incredibly valuable part of this effort. And I want to take a moment to speak to the thousands of women and men on our fire lines, the air crews, the, the soldiers, the, the contractors and everyone else who is part of this firefighting effort. Your work is invaluable. It's hot, dirty, dangerous, highly technical, and incredibly demanding, both physically and mentally. We know you're tired. This is exhausting, backbreaking work, but we know that you're up to the task. You are among the best wildland firefighters in the world. And on behalf of all British Columbians, I can't thank you enough for all that you do. And people have been asking me how they can help with the firefighting effort. And the most important thing that British Columbians can do right now is allow firefighters to focus on the task at hand, to fight the fires. As Minister Farnworth noted in his remarks, all of us must be prepared to evacuate, have a plan in place, be ready to go and evacuate when you are ordered to do so. By working together, we will get through this 2021 fire season. We are just halfway through it and we have to remember that we all must work together to ensure that we continue to do what's needed in this province so thank you on the phone please press star one to enter the queue you will be limited to enter the queue you will be limited to one question and one follow-up please also remember to take your phone off mute you will not be audible until your name is called our first question today is from Marcella Bernardo, News 1130. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us today. I know it's been a very stressful 24 hours for many people. Um, just wanted to ask you about, you mentioned Minister Farmworth about the the um, 
the backseat firefighters that have been quick to go to social media and trying to tell these people how to do their jobs, what would you like to say to them about what it is that is being done out there and why these measures are being taken to try to keep everybody safe? We have an incredible wildfire service in this province. There's more than uh, uh, 3,000 people on the front lines, over uh, 1,000 of them contractors. We've got firefighters from over 100 from Mexico. We have firefighters from right across the country, other provinces, all doing their job. Uh, and a command structure that is composed of people who have spent their entire lives uh, in the firefighting business, and so they know what they're doing. Uh, they don't put in place uh, alerts and orders, uh, you know, without a great deal of thought. So when they're there, it's to protect people's lives. That's what it's about. So rather than trying to second guess people who spent their, li their entire lives protecting people, people need to follow those orders. They need to, fo they need to have a plan in place. Uh, uh, for if they need to leave quickly, that means, you know, when you're on alert, have your plan ready. That when the order is given, then you leave immediately. That's what people need to do. They also need to avoid doing things like going out into the uh, Okanagan Lake and uh, uh, boating close to get to, uh, to a fire and, and interrupting uh, helicopters that are trying to grab water or putting a drone in the air thinking, oh, isn't this great to take a picture of the fire when what they're doing is really hindering the fighting of that fire and putting crews' lives at danger and also uh, uh, hindering the, the, the ability of the firefighters to do their job. They need to, uh, they need to follow the directions uh, put out by the fire service. Marcella, did you have a follow-up? I did. I know that you mentioned that it's too hard right now to assess what damage has been done, but do you have any idea whether anybody may have died or whether horses, livestock, what, what kind of damage has been suffered as far as losses go? There's been, uh, there's been no indication of any loss of life uh, at this point. Um, what I can tell you is that at the earliest opportunity, obviously people will, uh, you know, RCMP uh, uh, will be in to, uh, to, assess the, uh, to assess the situation. But we've had no, we've had no reports of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of either missing people or people who've, uh, or any casualties at this point. Our next question today is from Georgie Smythe, CBC. Please go ahead. Hi, this is um, from Minister Farnworth. We've been hearing from residents of Westwold and Monty Lake last night and today who say they felt they weren't made a priority by the province when it came to containing the fire early on. Uh, we know the fire has been burning for three weeks now. How do you respond to criticism that this region needed more support and resources earlier? I will uh, direct that, uh, that uh, question to, uh, to the fire service, uh, uh, Minister Conroy uh, and Deputy Minister uh, Mannering to ensure that uh, fires are fought. Um, the uh, wildfire service is, has been uh, looking at all the fires across the province and, and making sure that uh, the number one priority of loss of life is considered as well, the next structures. Um, I know that uh, Deputy Minister uh, Manorin has the stats on, on the different fires across the province, but um, the, the firefighters are professionals and they look to where they need to go and where they need to be to do the best work that they can. Minister, or Deputy Minister, if you want to add to that. Yes, thank you. And thank you for the question. Um, no, this, this fire has been uh, an important fire for the wildfire service uh, since it began. And we have been fighting it very aggressively and, and putting a, an awful lot of resources on it. The challenge with this fire is, is the drain and the dryness and the conditions and the lack of rain uh, over that period of time. At this point in time, we have over 136 uh, firefighters uh, operating on this, including uh, more than 13 helicopters, more than 40 pieces of equipment operating on this fire right now, in addition to the structural protection units um, that deploy in advance of the fire and, and, uh, and set up to protect uh, property. So it is a priority for the, the wildfire service, as Minister Farnworth just mentioned. Um, we are uh, treating this as our top uh, priority now given the size and and the interface nature of this fire. And did you have a follow-up? I do. Um, another one for uh, Minister Farnworth is possible. Uh, Farnworth is possible. Um, we understand that there are dozens of people still in Westwold, up to 60 I'm told, still disobeying the evacuation orders who say they don't trust the wildfire service to protect their property. Uh, today they're still unwilling to leave their properties. How do you respond to this lack of trust felt by residents in this area? They are putting their lives at danger. 
They are putting the lives of firefighters in danger. They are hindering efforts to get the very fire that they're concerned about under control. And the best thing that they can do is follow the instructions of the wildfire service, which the overwhelming number of people in this province do, and uh, if it's an evacuation order, leave immediately. Our next question today is from Keith Baldry, Global. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, um, thanks for this, Minister Farnworth. What, do you have any extra powers under a state of emergency to deal with these people who are disobeying evacuation orders? Are there any penalties or uh, things you can levy on them if they're just basically refusing to obey orders? Are, there are uh, penalties uh, that, uh, that can be used up to uh, about a $10,000 fine. Um, we have not ever had to use these in the past uh, in this province. Uh, and the reality really is this. People need to understand these are very aggressive fires. And they may think they know what they're doing. The fact is, is that they don't. And when you've got wind gusts of 60 miles an hour, extreme dryness, fire moves very, very quickly. And as we saw last night, some people had to be rescued and firefighters' lives were put in danger because those people felt they knew better. The reality is this, people need to follow instructions. When there's an evacuation order, they need to leave. Keith, did you have a follow-up? Yes, I do. Um, the prospect of many people being evacuated raises questions. Are you confident we have enough, you've secured enough space to accommodate what could be a very large number of people seeking uh, evacuation accommodation? No, we are, we are confident that we will uh, be able to have the space to, uh, to house evacuees. Just to put things into uh, to context, right now we're looking at about uh, just over 12,000 people in the province of BC have had to be evacuated, uh, many of them going to, uh, to relatives and friends uh, uh, for accommodation or to, uh, to evacuation centers uh, for accommodation. Uh, in 2017, at the peak, uh, we had about 60,000 people who had been evacuated. So we are working very closely with communities as from uh, Prince George down to the lower mainland, uh, taking into account obviously issues around COVID that we've got in the central Okanagan to make sure that there are spaces for people. Our next question is from Alyssa Thibault, CTV. Thank you, uh, Just in regards to the people that, um, that may have, have lost homes, uh, similar to uh, those that were living in Lytton, will there be any extra support given by the province Obviously, we have to do a, an assessment of, of what has, uh, has taken place, uh, but clearly if people have lost a home, then, uh, then you would see the same kind of supports uh, that have been in place uh, for Lytton, for example. And did you have a follow-up? Our next question is from Nick Johansson, Castanet News. Hi, Minister Farnworth. Uh, we've had reports uh, here of a hotel in Vernon refusing to honor evacuees' vouchers from BC Emergency Services. Um, can you speak to what recourse an evacuee who's in this situation might have? If you can send us the details on that, uh, we will, uh, we will uh, get on top of that right away. Uh, it, it is just unacceptable for a hotel with a voucher issued by BC Wildfire Service to not honor and accept it. And did you have a follow-up? Yeah, could you speak a little bit about uh, what kind of um, accommodation is being provided for evacuees uh, in addition to hotels? Are, are there any large uh, large spaces being set up at this time? There are So there are hotels. There are also group lodging places uh, in different parts of the province that are being used. Uh, we also have been working with communities to identify and have in place, if needed, um, um, you know, gymnasiums or recreational centers such as we've used in the past, whether it's 2017 or other or other years where that's been necessary. So we, there's a variety of uh, there's a variety of, of accommodation that uh, that emergency management BC uh, will be able to make available. And obviously, the I think for most people, the preference is to go somewhere where they know and ideally, uh, if they're able to stay with uh, family or friends, uh, that's uh, that we, we we strongly encourage that as well. Our next question is from Colton Davies, Radio NL. Please go ahead. Hi there. Thanks for doing this today and for the up-to-minute up uh, up information that we had there. Um, and for Minister Conroy, you mentioned that uh, climate change and extreme hot and dry weather uh, have been reasons for our wildfire season. 
Um, just in your opinion as the forest minister, how much has our forest management contributed to the extreme fires that we've been seeing? Uh, we hear all the time about extreme fuel loads uh, in our most of our crown land, and experts talk about things like killing off broadleaf trees like aspens, which are natural fire breaks. So uh, how much of our fire season, I mean, if, if you could even measure it, is you know, attributed to how we manage. Well, actually, we've been doing, um, th thanks, Colton, for the question. And we, we've been doing a lot of work um, to get communities fire safe and working right across the province with different communities and and with uh, uh, different uh, organizations to ensure that uh, we are, are working hard to get fire safe communities. And those communities are, are have noticed the difference uh, in, in their area. Um, so it is something that we're looking at. And, and the industry is also looking at uh, different ways of, of working because it, it doesn't do any good for them to see the, the forest burn. So we need to make sure that we are moving ahead, keeping climate change in mind and, and thinking about uh, how do we bring the forest industry into the 21st century? That's part of the reasons behind our intentions paper of doing things differently and, and making sure that we can work with communities on, on ensuring their fire safe is, is a critical issue. Colton, did you have a follow-up? I do, thanks. And uh, thanks for that answer, Minister. And I mean, with that in mind, uh, you know, when we eventually, it seems like never ending at this point, but when we eventually get to the end of this fire season in the interior and there's a post-mortem and, you know, I know we're always looking at the recommendations from the Abbott Chapman report. Uh, could this be the year maybe where we see uh, an overhaul in, in some of our forest practices in terms of, you know, funding allocated for things like uh, fuel prevention, uh, fuel mitigation work and, you um, you know, different measures to uh, prevent uh, some of these wildfires are, that we're seeing. Could this, you know, could we see widespread changes at any point this year? That's exactly things we are talking about. I was uh, recently with uh, Minister Farnworth and the Premier in um, at Lillooet at the fire camp there and talking to some of the firefighters about some of the things we can do and we can be looking at uh, actually having people work year round and, and when they're not fighting fires they're, they're mitigating the risk working in communities and because uh, who would know better on how to mitigate that risk than the actual firefighters themselves and so we're looking at things that we can do differently things that have never been done before so yes we, we definitely are looking at that I don't know Deputy Minister if you wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, I, I would like to add, thank you for the question. Um, as the minister spoke about the intentions paper, we know that, and, and this was a recommendation coming out of the Abbott Chapman review from 2017, that for example, we need to bring fire back onto the land base as an important tool to prescribe fire uh, to help us manage uh, you know, fuel loads um, amongst other things and with our partners. And we're, we're already advancing on that as a primary objective. And the other part of your question, maybe I'll in part answer here, is one of the reasons for the extreme fire behavior, in addition to the extreme dry conditions we have, is uh, you know things like mountain pine beetle uh, stands that get infected by uh, you know forest insects on a large scale, and uh, and that type of fuel, in particular with the White Rock Lake fire, is the primary issue that we're dealing with up there. And it's because of some of the forest management work that we've done uh, with our industry partners in that area that we're able to uh, work work this fire in, in different ways uh, that we wouldn't have been able to before. So like, like the minister said, the intentions paper is meant to take us further in that direction. And we're pretty confident that we're gonna be making positive strides in this area. That's all the questions we have for today. Thank you everyone for joining. That concludes today's event. Today's event. <laughs>